Albert Einstein, probably the greatest mind of this 20th century. The Time magazine voted him as the man of the century. Brilliant, brilliant man. In fact, uh, he was so brilliant, I think they have uh, preserved his brain in a museum just to do some research on it. What made this man to be that genius? But there are also several stories about Dr. Einstein, about how he was also absent-minded, you know, like typical of many, I think, professors, right? So this great man was traveling one day by train from his place to another place to deliver a lecture. As the train was going, after some time, the ticket uh, collector, he was passing through, checking the tickets of each person. And as he was checking, he came as Albert Einstein saw this man approaching him. He put his hand inside his pocket to take his ticket. But to his great consternation, he suddenly realized that the ticket was missing. So he began to search in his trouser pockets, he began to search in his briefcase, but the ticket could not be found anywhere. And he began to panic. So now the man came, the ticket collector stood in front of him, and, uh, and then he recognized him. You know, he was a very famous person. Albert Einstein said, hey, I couldn't find my ticket. He said, don't worry, I know who you are, so don't worry. And then he walked away, you know, he looked, checked the other guys, and as he went to the end of the compartment, he turned around to see what Einstein was doing, and Einstein was continually, frantically searching for his ticket. So he felt very bad for him, so he walked back, and he looked at him and said, uh, Sir, I know who you are. You don't have to worry about your ticket. And Einstein looked at him and said, uh, Young man, I also know who I am. But my problem now is that I do not know where I am going. Okay. <laughs> he lost his uh, memory to some extent of where he was going, so he needed his ticket to remind himself, right? Where am I going? Where are we going? Paul was in a particularly difficult moment in his ministry where he was not sure where he was going. You know, sometimes we think Paul has, you know, everything was smooth and fell in place and God was constantly speaking. He was going from place to place. But there were moments in his life, like in all of our lives, there are moments of anxiety. There are moments of seeking God's direction. And I want to briefly speak to you from Acts chapter 16, where Paul was wondering the direction where God was leading him. And finally, that led him to this great city of Philippi and the conversion of a woman called Lydia. So the title of my sermon is The Textile Entrepreneur Who Transformed Europe. Right? The Textile Entrepreneur Who Transformed Europe. If you read through the book of Acts, sometimes you can think that as if the great work of ministry and mission was done by the apostles and Peter and John and Paul. And of course, God used all these great men and women of God. But also in the midst of all these, there were great exciting stories of men and women. Often very briefly they are introduced, but their lives have been so important in the transformation of several nations. So I want to briefly place before you the life of Lydia and see how God used her in the transformation of Europe. Now we look at Acts chapter 6, you notice in the previous chapter, Acts 15, was the momentous chapter, probably one of the greatest chapters in the book of Acts, where the first church council met in Jerusalem, and they came to a conclusion that the Gentiles need not become like Jews in order to be Christians. It was one of probably the greatest decisions the church made at that time simply because otherwise you and I cannot be who we are today. A group of people said a Gentile must go through circumcision. Gentiles must follow the Mosaic dietary laws in order to be considered a Christian. But it was in Acts chapter 15 we read how that church council decided, no, they can become a follower of Jesus by trusting and by believing in him. It was a great moment. But unfortunately, what happens immediately following that, we notice the split between Paul and Barnabas. Often, sometimes after great successes, if you're not careful, it can also lead to some very difficult moments in various ways. And here, Paul and Barnabas would split. 
And Paul picks up Timothy and Silas and they began this missionary journey. Now as they went through different places, you know, in Acts chapter 16, we read that they were trying to go to different places in verse 6 onwards, we see. But Paul was going in the region of Phrygia, in Galatia. But we read that the Holy Spirit kept Paul from getting into the province of Asia. Paul wants to go into the province of Asia. This is not the continent of Asia, but it is the province of Asia. Often we call it Asia Minor, which is currently in Turkey. So Paul wanted to go into Asia Minor, but the Spirit of God would stop him. And then he wanted to go into a place called Bithynia. And again, we see the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to do so. You notice here, Paul wanted to go here to serve and the spirit of God would stop him. He wanted to go here to go and minister, the spirit of God would stop him. So he was at that moment wondering, God, what are you doing with me? What is your will and purpose for me? Where are you leading me? Sometimes you... And I could get into those moments, right? Moments of, Lord, what are you doing with my life? Lord, what do you want me to do? Where are you directing me? But as you continue to follow the Lord, the Lord speaks to you in various ways. And here God speaks to him through a vision, what we commonly call as the Macedonian call, right? In the vision, he saw a man, a Macedonian who comes and tells Paul, please come over to Macedonia and help us. And the team thought, hey, this is what God wants us. And then they immediately, you know, got up the next early morning. They got into a ship. They went down to a place called Troas. They got a vision in Troas. Troas was this tip, the tip of the Asian continent. And they need to, you know, pass over the sea to the other side. And this is now, Paul is now moving into, and we read in verse 12, he said that we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, the leading city of the district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. Now Paul was moving into the, that was the first time, the gospel is moving into Macedonia, into Europe, and four centuries earlier, a famous man would come out of Macedonia, but cross the sea and he will come into Asia. Do you know who he was? Four centuries before Paul, there was a famous king, right? Who would come out of Macedonia, Alexander the Great. They called him Alexander the Great because this man wanted to capture the whole world. You may have heard or you may have read in your history, Alexander the Great came out of Macedonia. He would come into Asia all the way up to part of India and he had one desire. The desire was that somehow he must spread the Greek culture, the Greek language, the Greek civilization throughout the whole world. Now notice four centuries later, now in the opposite direction, Paul is going. Paul doesn't have the great military might of Alexander. He was not a king, but you notice what happened. Trusting Jesus Christ, this man moves over into Europe. And we notice here how the first church was planted in the great city of Philippi. Where is Alexander today? Like, where is Greece? Where is Macedonia? Where is the Greek where is the culture? Where is the civilization? But you notice what even you and I would sit here and meditate upon what Paul did through thousand years ago. Why is it so important for the church to know? Because there are moments in our lives, even today, when you go and meet with several leaders or several Christians in churches, when you see the leaders of the world seemingly so powerful and in relation to their power, sometimes we seem to be weak and ordinary. Just like the spies would come back from Canaan and tell Moses and the Israelites, Oh, they are all giants and we look like grasshoppers before them. Sometimes we Christians, we can get into that grasshopper syndrome, isn't it? Oh, I am ordinary. We are little. We are a minority. I'm just a few in my college, in my business place, in my work spot. What can I do? But you notice that when you and I, in the power of the Spirit of God, trusting and depending upon Jesus, when we are faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we become a witness for Jesus Christ, it is God who works on our behalf. 
It is God who honors the preaching of the word. It is God who takes his gospel and he plants it in the hearts of people and he does the work of transformation. When the church takes its eyes away from God, then you and I would be afraid of every person in the world, no matter how strong they may seem to be. But you and I know that our Lord is still upon the throne. When young Isaiah would walk into the temple, we read in Isaiah chapter 6, the nation was in turmoil. King Uzziah was dead. The famous king who would later become leprous. Now the nation was going through a moment of anxiety. And young Isaiah would walk into the temple and you notice what he saw. He saw a vision of God seated on a throne, high and exalted. And the train of his robes would fill the temple. And he would hear the cherubims and the seraphim say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. Sometimes I often have to remind our brothers and sisters, if you notice the vision, you notice that it is not God is seated within the church, within the temple. God is seated on a throne high and exalted and it is the train of his robes that fills the temple. You get the point? Because sometimes in our thinking, we think as if God doesn't have the power to work outside the confines of Christianity. Oh, those are all those kind of people who have power, but you know, as if God works only within the Christian realm. God is seated on the throne. The whole earth is full of his glory. May you and I never domesticate the power of God within the four walls of a church. Our God reigns. Our God is seated upon the throne. The day the Christian church, the day the community of God's people lose sight of this fact, you and I would be afraid of every other person who is sitting on the earthly thrones. God needed to remind Isaiah, hey, Uzziah is dead, but God is still on the throne. God is still on the throne. Imagine when Paul would cross that ocean on a ship, taking that precarious journey into Europe. There was not much fanfare. Nobody would have known that here is a man coming with the gospel. But look what kind of transformation it would do to that place. And now when they were there, we read the story here that how they went and met this group of women who were praying just outside the city. And there was this lady called Lydia. And Lydia, we read in verse 14, and she was a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira. Now Thyatira was in Asia Minor, in the province of Asia, in modern day Turkey. So Thyatira was there. So Lydia was a migrant. Okay, so she's moved from there and she's moved to Philippi. So she was a migrant and she was a rich woman because she was a dealer in purple cloth. Purple being the color of the king or the royal color. So generally the dealer in purple cloth would be considered as a rich person. So she was a rich person. She was a migrant. She didn't belong to Philippi, but she has come from Thyatira. And then we also read that she was a worshiper of God. She didn't know Jesus personally, but there was a category of people who would worship God or seeking the true God. And often they would come and participate and be on the fringes of synagogues. In several other places you would read about God fearers. So Lydia was one among them, and you notice here when Paul spoke the word of God to him, the first thing we read is that the Lord opened her heart, right? The Lord opened her heart. We read in verse 14, right? The Lord opened her heart. So the first thing Lydia did was, right, there is this interesting dynamic here because on one hand, it is the Lord who opens the heart because right, he is the sovereign Lord. And at the same time, we must remember there is also a human responsibility. God has given us the free will and he would not overpower our free will. So in some way, even as God's grace is enabling Lydia, Lydia as well opened her heart to Jesus Christ. 
So the first thing we notice here about Lydia is, even though she was a rich woman, she was a God-fearer, she was a migraine, and here she opens her heart to Jesus Christ. There was a submission to Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing we learn about this woman. She was an entrepreneur. She was a businesswoman, and you notice what happened. She opened her heart to Jesus. And then what happens when Jesus comes into your life, when the gospel is deeply embedded within you, as you surrender your lives, the first thing you notice what happens is that you cannot keep the gospel to yourself. If you say you are a follower of Jesus and the gospel is within your heart, you cannot keep the gospel to yourself. We read here that later, you see the next verse, verse 15. When she and the members of her household were baptized, right? Suddenly you notice an addition, a group of people, a network of a relationship that were also brought into the kingdom. So she not only kept the gospel to herself, the immediate response of her was, the next response of her was that, you know, the gospel was taken to her household. She began to speak the gospel to others as well. It's so important, it's so important that if Jesus has blessed you, if Jesus has blessed you, the important thing is that we must become a blessing to others, right? Unfortunately, what has happened is a particular type of theology has become so popular today in Christianity. Right? I often say that, you know, probably the word that is most used, misused and abused in today's Christianity is the word blessing. Right? You open any Christian magazine, you scan any Christian channel, it's always about blessing, blessing, blessing. Now, does the Lord bless you and me? Yes, indeed. If the Lord has not blessed you and me, you and I would not be here today. The Lord blesses his people in every way. The Lord blesses his people. We must never forget that. But remember, there is only one side of the coin. Often we stop with that and say, Lord, bless me, bless me. And if you're not careful, it, it can develop a type of greed and a discontentment within them. But you must pause and ask yourself, what's the other side of the coin? Why has God blessed me? Why has God blessed me? If you notice Genesis 12, when God told Abraham, Abraham, I will bless you. I will bless you with this. I will bless you with this. He will go on all those blessings. And at the end, he would say, you will become a blessing to the nations. If a Christian forgets that, that's why it has become today. In several churches today, people have forgotten missions. Why? Because we have become a very consumerist form of faith. Lord, what are you going to give me? What are you going to give me? What are you going to give me? But we never or rarely pause to say, Lord, why have you blessed me? It's not to become containers of God's blessings, but it is to become channels of God's blessings. Otherwise, you would become or we would become simply a consumerist Christians. People of convenience coming to God only for blessing, but never ever become a blessing to the nations. But we learn from Lydia, when she opened her heart to Jesus Christ, right? what happens? She said, Lord, I don't want to be a container of blessing. Of course you have blessed me, Lord. I have come as a migrant from Thyatira. A few years ago, I was in Istanbul, and from there I visited the seven churches, you know, in Revelation 2 and 3. I had the opportunity to go, and remember when we were in Thyatira, the Muslim guide, the Turkish Muslim guide was talking about how Thyatira in those days used to be a very thriving center for textiles, particularly, you know, excellent material would come out of Thyatira. And that's why she had moved to Philippi. Philippi was, you know, a very popular city, a Roman colony, originally a city that was founded by King Philip, uh, who was the father of Alexander the Great. But during the Roman Empire, it has become a Roman colony. They are very proud of their Roman heritage. That's why later on when Paul writes to Philippians, you know, he talks in Philippians too, how, you know, you must humble yourself and become like Jesus Christ. But in that city, this woman, God touches her heart and God has blessed her. And now she says, Lord, how can I be a blessing to you? 
how can I be a blessing you? Lord, I do not simply want to keep accumulating the blessings you have given me. I do not want to be a mere container of your blessings, but I want to be a channel of your blessing. When we lived in America for several years while I was studying, you drive through, you would see several churches with big neon signs outside, all kinds of uh, interesting statements. One church had a statement that said, Jesus only, okay? Jesus only. And overnight, a hurricane came and it knocked off the first three letters, okay? So the next morning when people gathered around it in big letters, they saw, what was it written? Us only, isn't it? Us only. It's a slippery slope. You can very easily move from Jesus only to us only. Several churches that have started as Jesus only have now moved away into an us only mode. Several Christians who have started as Jesus only have now become me only, us only. Why does God call you and me that you would become a blessing to the nations. So we were invited to an African American church there one time. And uh, you know, it's a very fascinating experience if you go and participate in an African American worship service. Okay, you know, you may have 10 people, but it sounds as if there are 100 people, right? Very vibrant. And if there are 10 people and you are preaching, there will be 11 sermons going simultaneously. Okay, right? uh, you would be preaching and people say, come on, yes, preacher, you know, keep going. And uh, I still remember when I went to speak there, a friend of mine said, Prabhu, you need to watch out for this guy who sits right at the front and he could be really loud. And indeed, he was very loud. Okay? Uh, I would speak and you say, yes, preacher, you know, I would raise my voice, he would raise his voice, okay? <laughs> and we were soon competing for decibel levels, okay? Uh, it was going on like that, and I still remember, I told the verse for reference, and I was flipping the pages of my Bible to take that reference. Everybody was quiet, and in loud voice, I still remember, you know, he would say, preacher, take your time, take your time. <laughs> All kinds of, you know, interesting comments they would say. I often say in my 25 years of preaching ministry, that was the only time somebody said, preacher, take your time, okay? <laughs> Most of the time they say, don't take my time, okay? But what I remember about the little African-American church was they had a poster on the altar. And in the poster they had written, joy. J-O-Y. Near J, they had written Jesus first. Near O, others next. Near Y, yourself last. Christ-centered, other-oriented, self-denying life. If you would ask me who is a true follower of Jesus Christ, can you describe a, a true follower of Jesus Christ? I would say somebody who is Christ-centered, other-oriented, and self-denying person. You read through the Gospels, you read through the teachings of Jesus Christ, you will understand who a true follower of Jesus Christ is. If we are not careful today, my dear brothers and sisters, what is happening in today's churches, in today's, in some of the teachings. As if God exists only to bless you and me. As if God is a cosmic Santa Claus, right? Sitting up there and his only duty is to do whatever you ask him to do. What kind of God is this? Sometimes I wonder who is God and who is the servant of God. Right? Sometimes you say, God, I command you to do this. Where do we get it from the scripture? Where from the scripture do we get this? I think we need to get back to the word and get back to a clarity of who the God of the Bible is. And why he has placed you and me in this world. Of course he would bless us, but to become a blessing to the nations. If we are not careful, we can buy into all sorts of theologies that may go around. That is kind of legitimizing greed and camouflaging materialism in the name of God. 
constantly saying, God, I'm not happy with this. Now, when I'm not happy with this car, what is the next car you're going to give? I'm not happy with this car, this house. What is the next kind of house? Is? Tell me, where is the limit to that? When do you stop with that? And it, at the same time in our own nation, there are hundreds of thousands of people who have never heard the gospel even one time. In our own nation, I have been places where people could not come inside a church. They could not worship under a church simply because of the kind of oppression they are under. When I wrote my PhD thesis, I wrote my thesis on the persecution of the church in India. I met with people who have gone through tremendous persecution and yet who continue to serve Jesus Christ faithfully. We need to ask what kind of God are we serving? What kind of gospel are we believing in? When Lydia heard the gospel, God opened her heart. She submitted her life and then she became a blessing to others. And now you notice what happened. Not only did her household got baptized and the next one we see here is in verse 15 and she tells Paul and his friends she invited us to her home if you consider me a believer in the Lord she said come and stay at my house right verse 15 I like this word it says and she persuaded us right no wonder she was a great businesswoman right she knows how to persuade people you know she put a threat to Paul hey if you think I'm a believer I want you to come to my home but you notice what happened now she not only opened her heart, but she also opened a home. She also opened her. She said, hey, here is a blessing the Lord gave me. And this is not just for my own selfish consumption. God, once I've realized that you have blessed me, Lord, let my life become a blessing to others, Lord. What do I have, Lord, that I can open up for you and your kingdom purposes? Would you ask that to God, Lord? What is that, Lord, in my life you have blessed me with that I could open up for kingdom purposes? I'm not talking just about money. Blessing is not just about money. But think about all the ways in God has blessed you with and say, Lord, what do you want me to open up this morning, God, for your kingdom purposes? Let me point to one more verse before I would close. Now you notice when you come to a little down from uh, 16 onward, uh, there was this girl who was caught up with evil spirit and she would predict the future through the evil spirit. And so Paul would drive out the evil spirit and her owners would lose a lot of money because they were making a lot of money through this girl. You know the story. So they all got so upset and they took Paul and Silas to the magistrate and they were put in prison. And they were singing in the night and the Lord in his power, he would come and the doors of the prison would shake and we read that the doors were open, isn't it? I really like this chapter. You know why? Because on one hand, we have a God who is able to open the hearts of people and we have a God who is able to open the doors of the prison. Hallelujah. That's the God we have. That's the God we have. The power to open the hearts of people and the power to open the doors of prison cell. That's the God we have. That's what gives you and me confidence. That's what will give us the power, the courage to face people, the courage to face difficult situations. Because we have a God who has the power to open not only hearts of people, but also the doors of prison. And later on, as narrative goes on, the people came to know that, uh, you know, the Philippi jailer would become a follower of Jesus and the people and the magistrate would hear they were Roman citizens, they were afraid and they would then let them out. And now you notice, come to chapter 16 and the final verse, verse 40. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. Then they left. Now what has happened? Where did they, the brothers and sisters are meeting? Now they have begun to meet in the house of Lydia, right? House of Lydia. She not only opened a house for God's people, her hospitality, but now she had opened a house for fellowship. Now I think probably the first church in Europe was planted in the house of this lady. What a great story, isn't it? 
what a marvelous story of transformation when you open up your life to Jesus Christ what he can do with your life and with my life as ordinary it may seem to be but when we surrender our lives to Jesus it is remarkable to see what God can do with our lives but you also notice that the mood of the whole city was against the Christians at the time so it was a dangerous thing it was a risky thing for her to open her house to Paul and Silas okay it was not like earlier now they are coming back from prison earlier the whole city was against them and now she is opening her house to these very same people she may think hey what would happen to my business what would happen to my career the whole city may boycott her business we do not know what would happen to my career but she said lord you are on the throne i know you will take care of it lord but if this is a blessing you have given me lord i want to become a blessing for kingdom purposes what a remarkable story isn't it of lydia as you and i are in god's presence would you bring your life and say jesus here am i lord here am i i open my life to you god whatever i have belongs to you lord thank you for blessing me but lord i have one prayer I want to become a blessing to the nations. I want to become a blessing to my own country. I want to become a blessing to my city, Lord. I want to become a blessing to my family. I want to open up my life and I want to give it to you. Several centuries ago, when King Cromwell was ruling England, there was an acute shortage of silver in England. because of this acute shortage of silver you know they made silver coins the economy was on the verge of collapsing because there was an acute shortage of silver so the king sent his soldier in every direction if they could find silver anywhere and after you know great searching all over the country the soldiers came back to the king and said king we search for the silver everywhere we couldn't find the silver anywhere except in one place Cromwell was excited he said hey where did you find the silver they said sir we found silver in the cathedral because right in the biggest national cathedral we have this big statues of saints all made of solid silver and that is the only place where we found silver what do we do what do we do he thought for a moment and then he looked at his soldiers and said well let's do something you go and bring those statues and let us melt them let us melt the saints and circulate them in the society let us melt the saints right and make them as silver coins and circulate them in the society and i believe that's what god wants us to do with you and me lord this morning would you melt me and would you circulate me in the society when you look around the need the need is so great right it's humongous sometimes you wonder god how in the world can i meet this need but look at the little boy all he had was five loaves of bread and two fish right it's enough for a little boy for one time lunch of a little boy but when he would give it to jesus christ it takes a different dimension it? it takes a different dimension the boy could have thought hey i do not know whether jesus would do a miracle or not i don't want to lose my lunch so what do i do in case of emergency in case if jesus doesn't do a miracle what do i do let me take two fish right two loaves of bread and one fish separately and let me give the rest to jesus if he can do miracle with five loaves of bread he can do miracle with three loaves isn't it he could have reasoned that but he didn't do that what did he say he said lord what i have is little but what i do is i give it all i give it all to you jesus the need around us is so big but what god is looking for you and me this morning is to give it all give it all to jesus and say lord here am i i'm opening up my life to you lord may it be used for kingdom purposes 
melt me and circulate me in the society.